like to introduce you our two chair, Dr. Akira Miyata from Japan and Dr. Zhu Song Yu from Taiwan, and three commentators, Dr. Xing Junxian from Taiwan, Dr. Solacha Rukapano from Thailand, and Dr. Tegu Malfen from Indonesia. First, uh, uh, I will uh, introduce the Alexander Meyer, uh, give us uh, the, what the first talk. No, it's not a nightmare. It's, uh, the topic is uh, my surgical strategy to achieve high ABSS success. Morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes? Yes, very well. So, Greetings from Germany. Here it is still dark and cold. We have six o'clock in the morning. Dear Jackie, dear Paul, thank you very much for the invitation to this extraordinary meeting. And uh, as a small thank you, I, I have a, I prepared a small gift for all the participants and all the audience which you will get at the end of my presentation. So I will change to full screen and to show you my presentation. Okay, so my task today is to tell you something about the surgical strategy, how to achieve high AV excess success rates. And talking about this topic, time will be my biggest enemy. For some of you, it might be a fresh and up to, not with Paul, but with me. And I hope that for the rest of you, I can give you some tips and tricks to improve your performance. I mean, we will never succeed in 100%, but failure rates between 20 and 50% are not acceptable. And the question is, what can we do to reduce them? Imagine we could predict the success of our fistula by giving some parameters in a web-based software, which um, will show us in less than 10 minutes our calculated blood flow and the successful fistula. And this sounds pretty cool, like science fiction, but the personalized, computerized arteriovenous fistula is already subject of a, an experimental multicenter trial in the Netherlands. But till this clinical routine, we must realize that the creation of an arteriovenous fistula needs manual skills, experience, a lot of people ready to assist the problems and to keep the fistula running. And the problem is vascular access surgery is influenced by many factors and there's a very complex interaction between various parameters which need to be considered. But at the end of the day, I think all of you agree with me that flow is the most important factor for a long lasting successful arteriovenous fistula. So let's start at the beginning. The so-called pre-dialysis education plays a big role to maximize success. And this means that the patient must be informed, he must be sensitized about his vascular excess. Hygienical aspects, the possibility of vein training, the importance of preserving veins and self-control must be brought to the patient and his family. And the nephrologist must refer the patient at an early time to the surgeon. The surgeon himself, his decision making is based on individual factors of the patient. Mapping can help to select the right vessel at the right localization. Of course, our aim is to create a native fistula at first. Surgery has to be success oriented, and at the end of the operation, we need an intraoperative quality assessment, a completion control a final check. So what we need is a multidisciplinary collaborating team and therefore interdisciplinary meetings like this are so important to provide uh, an exchange in experience and to improve the outcome of our performance. 
And for those of you who want to know more about the roles of the different players pre and post creation of the arterial venous fistula, there's a good overview in this article published in 2016 in the Canadian Journal of Kidney Health and Disease. So how, how can we achieve high AV excess success rates? And I want to show you our surgical strategy with some practical aspects illustrated by short videos. The first step we make is a physical examination. We must get an impression of the patient, an idea what kind of excess we can create, what is possible and what is promising. And it is very important to evaluate the pulse quality at both arms look for arm swelling, collateral veins, CIEDs, previous operations or scars. And this video shows something which should not happen, the puncture of a forearm vein, which can damage a potential vein for our AV excess. And don't forget to measure the blood pressure at both arms. The Allen test, most guidelines recommend the Allen test uh, to prove the patency of the palmar arch and the collateralization between the radial and ulnar artery. But in practice, this test has a low sensitivity, about 50% and a cutoff, which is not clear defined. Even its modification, the Barbeau test with pulse oximetry is not well established and it's more discussed in the cardiologic community concerning the transradial approach for angiography, but uh, we don't use it routinely. The second step is mapping. We start with a standardized systematic mapping of the vessels and the anatomy of the inflow artery, the outflow vein, and the potential needle stick segment. We are measuring the diameter of the vein and the artery first with tourniquet and then without tourniquet to get an impression of vein distensibility. In my eyes, there is no clear threshold uh, what diameter, which diameters are promising or not. I mean, there is, it seems to be that all diameters above two millimeters seems to be good, but um, there's no reason not to connect an artery with a diameter of 1.6 or 1.8 millimeters with good pulse quality, no calcification. There's no reason not to connect such an artery. And at the end of the mapping, we mark the skin incision and plan surgery for the next day. Some of you might use the post ischemic resistance index as a predictive factor. The post ischemic resistance index can help to evaluate if the inflow artery is capable to achieve high blood flow by post ischemic dilation. Uh, we don't use it routinely, but if we do, we inflate the cuff to a suprasystolic volume till blood flow suspends. And when you relieve the pressure, you can see the increased blood flow, uh, the diastolic blood flow and NRI be below 0 0.7 seems to be promising. Uh, there is a big discussion about mapping in the literature. Perhaps you know the meta uh, analysis and Cochrane analysis from 2015. But uh, one of the latest studies, a study from Austria, with a really clear defined prospective design with more than 300 patients. And they could show that uh, in the duplex ultrasound group, the patency rate was higher than in the uh, clinical evaluated group. Um, and even more distal radial cephalic fistulas could had been, had been created in the duplex ultrasound group. The revision rate overall and per patient was higher in the ultrasound group. And furthermore, there was a cost saving of 2,003 euros per patient. So let's have a look at our surgical technique, step three. We always use magnifying glasses because I think this is an essential requirement for a vascular access surgery and they are very helpful. The dissection of the tissue is uh, very, very dry um, by using a bipolar forceps. 
And first we are preparing the vein and then we are preparing the artery. The vascular sheath of the artery is opened longitudinally. And then the artery is encircled with vessel loops and retracted. <clears throat> After dissection, the vein and the side branches are ligated and the vein is transected distally. Then a soft bulldog is placed over the vein, which is not always necessary. We make an adequate incision in the posterior wall of the vein. And then we make an adequate incision in the anterior wall of the artery using an ophthalmologic scalpel, taking great care not to damage the posterior wall of the artery. And then the incision is extended with a pot scissor. The outflow artery and the inflow artery are cannulated to install heparin solution. And then the vessel loops are released and replaced by clamps. And then a side to end anastomosis normally is created with four running sutures beginning at the heel of the anastomosis. We use fine absorbable suture material 6.0 or smaller. And uh, the running sutures are stopped at the middle of the anastomosis and suturing is completed beginning from the distal angle. And then the bullock clamps are removed and you should have a running fistula. Let me show you one important thing. After removing the bulldog clamps, sometimes you can see such a small spasm in the outflow vein in the anastomotic segment. And uh, in this case, it is uh, very important by gentle milking to relieve this because otherwise this can promote a stenosis. Furthermore, it is very important to check the absence of kinking of the vein in the upper edge of the dissection and to, uh, it is imperative to avoid any torsion of the vein. Uh, let's talk about different configuration of the anastomosis. The side to end anastomosis is the gold standard, but there are some discussions about other types of anastomosis and I want to show you some modifications. Connecting the posterior wall of the vein with the anterior wall of the artery can help to prevent torsion of the vein. And this technique is called the piggyback straight line onlay technique, the P-slot technique. And the incidence of Huxta anastomotic stenosis might be decreased, if not eliminated with this technique. For me, it sounds plausible. So whenever possible, I use this technique more and more. An expensive alternative to the conventional anastomosis is the clip anastomosis uh, to avoid any penetration of the intima and thus uh, avoiding intima hyperplasia. The relative new development is an external support device which is placed around the anastomosis and it should standardize the anatomy of the, of, the, of the anastomosis. It should standardize the angle of the anastomosis and thus reduce intimal hyperplasia. And a new approach to perform distal radiocephalic fistulars uh, had been published by a French group and uh, they hypothesized that a uh, surgical technique that minimizes venous dissection uh, can help to prevent uh, anastomotic stenosis. And they reported about the radial artery deviation and reimplantation, the radar technique. The operation ends with a completion control. And um, in the meanwhile, transit time flow measurement and um, Ultrasound imaging are well established and increasingly imply, applied to evaluate the fistula and the advantages that you can detect problems immediately with a possibility to correct them. And the traditional hallmarks like venous dilation, 
thrill and Morma complete this final check. And in my eyes, completion control is the most important step to avoid an early failure of the fistula. The last step is postoperative evaluation. A thorough physical examination and ultrasound imaging is demanded to identify vascular access related ischemia or other vascular complications and non maturation. Inspection, palpation, and auscultation are performed in a systematic manner. The palpation of the fistula is performed not only at the body of the axis, but the whole way long to the chest wall. And the arm elevation test is performed by elevating the extremity with the fistula and examination of the normal collapse of the vein. A detailed ultrasound imaging uh, can provide a detailed information of intra excess uh, blood flow and a dynamic assessment of the fistula, which can help to decide when the fistula can be punctured. So, in summary, <clears throat> these are the factors for success, and I'm convinced that they are the answer of the question how to achieve high AV excess success rates. It's pre-dialysis education, physical examination, ultrasound mapping, surgery with a top performance, and an intraoperative completion control, a final check, and postoperative evaluation. So, ladies and gentlemen, you remember that in the beginning of my presentation, I promised you a gift, a tool for all of you to take home and which can support you all the time. And here it is. It's a phone. But it's a special phone with two buttons to press if you're in trouble. So use them, enjoy your work, and thank you very much. Uh, we thank uh, the Dr. Uh, Mayer's uh, very great talk. It's very clear cut for for us, as for, especially for me. I am the radiologist. I can use the knife to uh, perform the operation. It's very very clear information for me to learn how to create and how to evaluate. And now I open this uh, a short discussion for the uh, first. I introduce the co-chair. The doctor are uh, Miyata, if you raise your hand, and uh, also we have a common painter. Uh, the uh, right side from me is the doctor uh, um, Marvin, Ka Marvin, 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 and uh, also the doctor Xin Junxian, and so also online the doctor uh, Luca Pano. And also the Dr. Harris. So, uh, any comment or question to this uh, talk? Hello. 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 Can you hear us? Yes. 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 We can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So for the teleconference and thank you for the talk uh, given. So I'm just curious about how you um, uh, select your patient according to the duplex ultrasound. Because I think in, uh, in the Eastern uh, West, I think the vein size is quite big. Um, and uh, your, what's your threshold? For example, let's say for uh, forearm uh, uh, native fistula, whether it's still a 2.5 mm or 2 mm, with tunique or without tunique, so which how how do you prefer? Because uh, for me, I think normally I will select. Uh, I mean, vein size according to how they respond to the tunique. For example, if I scan the vein, it's only measured about two mm, but they actually uh, uh, dilated one tunique. So I think that vein is uh, potentially can be used. So I think my test show is still 2.5 on the tunique. So what are your comment on that? Oh, thank, you thank you very much for the question. As I mentioned, uh, 
I don't think that there is a clear threshold for vessel diameters. In our centers, the nephrologists always make a vessel mapping of the patient. Then the patients came to our, come to our new unit. And we, the vascular surgeons, always perform a vascular mapping too. And we, we, we perform it with tourniquet, first with tourniquet, and then without tourniquet, because sometimes you can get a good impression of vein distensibility when you measure with tourniquet and without tourniquet. But normally we measure with tourniquet and there is no, no clear threshold because um, you can connect an artery with a diameter of 1.6 mm with a vein of 1.8 mm and the fistula can measure. So I think you must get a good impression of the pulse quality of the vessel wall. Is there any calcification? Is there any stenosis of the artery? If not, you can use arteries with a diameter less than two millimeters. Uh, but if you have a diabetes patient and uh, a lot of calcification in the inflow artery, then it would be better to connect uh, an artery at the fossa cubiti uh, with a, a bigger diameter. So I think there is no clear threshold. You have to to, to try it in in, in uh, of your ex because of your experience, but uh, I wouldn't exclude an artery or a vein with a diameter with less than two mm's if they are good in quality. Yeah, I think I'm not going to give a fresh question, but I'm going to give a comment on the way you're handling the uh, spasm to Dr. Mayer. You say that you're doing a pinching or do something with a vein. Uh, but I saw also on your slide that you provide with an olive uh, sound. Do you also sound the vein to, pro to prevent the stenosis? Do you mean during the operation or before yes. the operation? D during the surgery. During, during surgery. surgery, yeah. At the end of surgery, we always make a completion control with transit time flow measurement and high resolution ultrasound imaging because you, you can immediately detect some irregularities of your anastomosis, for example, uh, stenosis, uh, capable vein valves, which are disturbing, or uh, flaps in the lumen of the uh, excess. So in my eyes, this is very important. If you have the possibility, use it, because you can um, correct those irregularities at once on the uh, operation desk and this can avoid an early failure of the fistula. Yeah, I mean, during the surgery, you mentioned about the spasm of the vein. So what yes. do you do during the spasm of the vein? Do you put an olive sound or you do a, a ballooning during the surgery? No, first of all, we are gentle milking or tapping of the, on the vein to, to relieve the spasm. And in, in most cases, the spasm will, will uh, relieve. No, we don't make a Fogarty maneuver or something else if you have a spasm. We, we are still, we are waiting and that's the best uh, treatment. What do you think using the normal saline pushing using a syringe to the vein, to dilate the vein? You can do this, but very, very gently. Because if you uh, have a too much pressure in your, in your uh, syringe when you are insulating heparin solution in the vein, you can uh, damage the intima and this leads to uh, to lesions to intima hypoplasia or something else so if you can you, if you install heparinized saline solution in the vein do it very very smooth okay. hello mayor this is cole hello. Uh, long time no see and it's i'm sad i'm so sad to not having you here but uh, I, I'm glad that you are online. I have two questions for you. Uh, first, how to use the flow measurement during the operation to enhance the patency of the fistula? Do you do any modification after what kind of measurement come out? Secondly, is, is there any medication in the world during the operation or after the operation which can enhance our fistula maturation? Thank you. Uh, the transit time flow measurement we are using routinely at the end of the operation and um, uh, there, is a, there is a cutoff 
there is a cutoff in my eyes uh, about 170 ml per minute. Um, this promises, this would promise success, I think. So we, we uh, made a trial of about 41 patients with transit time flow measurement and the cutoff was 170 ml per minute. There is a gray zone between 100 and 170 ml per minute, but if you have a fistula with less than 100 ml per minute, this will fail in 100% in my eyes. So that, that is what, what I can say. So the, the problem is if it's below 170, let's say, then do you re anastomosis or what do you do? If you, if you have a good thrill, if you have a good murmur, then if you have a good venous dilation and you have a flow around about 130 or 40 ml per minute, I would wait. I would accept this. And uh, I think in the most cases, your fistula will mature. Okay, so ra but, but raise the alert of future fituration, uh, maturation. Uh, then and how the about the medication? Question, any possible uh, oral medication? There are any trials about uh, liposomes, which you can uh, install around the anastomosis. Yep. Perhaps this can um, improve the fistula maturation rate, but uh, apart from this, I have no experience with yeah. other me medications which would uh, enhance the fistula maturation. Thank you. Next, we move to five nightmare case. And uh, in the all five nightmare case presented, we will open the discussion. Uh, next, we will. Uh, Welcome the Dr. Mayer again to give me the nightmare case. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, the worst nightmare for me is uh, the unexpected. Share your screen. Please say, uh, share your screen. Okay, just a moment. Can you see it? No, no. Hmm. Can you see me? No. Because the technical error, so uh, we moved uh, uh, next. Next nightmare is from the present by the Ki, Dr. Kichu, and uh, after uh, that we fix the technical problem. I will welcome the Dr. Mayer again. My name. And I'm an assistant professor in interventional radiology in Patras University Hospital in Greece. The theme of my talk today is going to be about a disastrous case of a central venous catheterization. As I'm not there today, I would like to share with you my credentials. If someone would like to have any questions or queries about this talk, here is some background info of the case. So the patient had a right-sided central venous catheter which was not working. It was occluded. Plus, there were uh, multiple previous occlusions in the past, so it was decided to change side of the catheter from the right to the left side. As you can see here with the red arrow, the right-sided catheter was not removed until the new one was set in place in order not to lose access in case of failure. An angiogram taken intraprocedurally shows that the contrast does go into the superior vena cava, as you see from the red arrow there. However, there seems to be a problem at the region of the left brachiocephalic vein, 
as you can see with the red transparent circle. If we take a closer look at the image, you can see that there are two different contrast areas with tissue in between. Plus, the wire is not going to the superior vena cava. The contrast shown with the red arrow is the proper route of the brachiocephalic vein. The white arrow shows extravasation, and the wire shown with the blue arrow was thought to be in a collateral vessel. What you can see here is a misleading final image of the left-sided catheter to be inside or just above the right atrium, as you can see from the red arrow. If you take a more careful look, you can see that there is probably some contrast outside the cardiac chambers, as you can see with the red arrow. Some minutes after the procedure, the patient was not feeling well. The operator requested a CT angiography that revealed contrast extravasation within the mediastinum and catheter placed within the mediastinum and outside the venous system. Patient was immediately transferred to the OR where the left side uh, central venous catheter was removed and the left brachiocephalic vein was ligated. The day after the surgery, patients started to have bilateral arm, face, neck, and breast swelling. CT angiography performed before surgery showed that the right side catheter was thrombosed and was occluding the right brachiocephalic vein and partly the superior vena cava. So the patient was brought back to the cath lab. An angiogram performed from the right arm verified the obstruction of the right brachiocephalic vein. You can also see with the white stars, the collaterals, the presence of the right side catheter with the red arrow, and also the, st the signs of the uh, sternotomy performed in the operating room. The wire was successfully negotiated through the obstructed brachiocephalic vein, and the right side catheter was removed before angioplasty. Post-angioplasty result was suboptimal and you can also appreciate the presence of some thrombus. So it was decided to insert a stent. A stent was inserted from the beginning of the right brachiocephalic vein to the uh, upper part of the superior vena cava. Here you can see the final angiogram. So the right brachiocephalic vein is patent down to the superior vena cava and also the right uh, central venous catheter was removed and it was placed in the right femoral vein. Retrospectively speaking, before deciding to change the side of the catheter, an angiogram through the right side catheter should have been performed that would have revealed the obstruction of the right brachiocephalic vein in the superior vena cava. This angiogram can be performed after a wire is inserted into the right atrium through the catheter and the catheter is retrieved as high as the jugular vein. Then angioplasty of the occluded vessels could have been performed and the above mentioned complications would have been avoided. Alternatively, and before proceeding to catheteric change, a CT venogram would have mapped the vessels at the area and proper planning of the procedure would have been possible. I would like to thank you for your attention and invite each and every one of you to our endovascular access meeting that is going to take place in Patras, Greece on June 12, 13, 2020. Next, we uh, uh, welcome the Dr. Mayer again to uh, give a, a short talk about the nightmare case. Welcome, Dr. Mayer yes. again. Mayer. Welcome back. I hope you can see my, my desktop. Do you see it? No. 
why not? Just a moment. Now? Not yet. Yeah? No. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So, yeah, the worst nightmare for me is the unexpected death of a patient during surgery, um, which teaches me that even vascular access doesn't have a zero mortality. But the unforgettable nightmare for today uh, is this case. Three thick files with uh, hundreds of documents of a female patient born in 1944, 98 kilos, a size of 1.5 meters, a BMI of 43. And she had a lot of comorbidities from obesitas, diabetes to chronic pain syndrome and COPD. Not so unusual for a German hemodialysis patient. Uh, and do you have any idea what this can be? It's not modern art. These are all the excess types at all localizations of this patient during her hemodialysis career. And this lasted from January 2005 to April 2013, 100 months and 49 operations and some complications. Uh, the story is so complex that I had to notice it. And the problems uh, we had to face were bad individual conditions of the patient, multimorbidity, bad vessels, recurrent excess thrombosis of unknown reasons and appearing infections. And everything began with an acute kidney failure in 2005 due to a rhabdomyolysis under pregabalin because uh, this medicament she took because of a chronic pain syndrome. And she had very bad vessels so that hemodialysis started with the central catheter via the right tubular vein. Then a native brachiocephalic fistula in the left fossa cubiti was created. And after maturation of this fistula, the catheter had been taken off. But within one week, three re-interventions at the fistula had been necessary. Reocclusion of the fistula occurred and the CVC via left tubular vein was implanted. After re-interventions without a permanent success, we changed the site and implanted a CVC via the right tubular vein. After several interventions, we decided to implant a forearm loop graft on the right side. This graft thrombosed and we had to do a lot of redo operations, six reinterventions, and then we uh, performed thrombectomy, patchoplasty of the venous anastomosis, angioplasty of the outflow vein, and after further operations, she got a wound infection at this localization with enterococcus, and the graft was given up. So, uh, new catheter was implanted on the right side and a little bit later a port system on the right side to applicate analgetics because of her chronic pain syndrome. Then we tried the subclavian subclavian prosthesis craft to implant on the left side and after a lot of re-interventions the veinous limb of this prosthesis craft was extended to the left tubular vein. Uh, the catheter on the right side was removed after a lot of free interventions. And in the meanwhile, all the teeth of the patient had been pulled out because of a purulent infection of the jaw. Stenosis of the protetovenous anastomosis occurred and was corrected with angioplastia and a nitinol stand implantation in the internal tubular vein. But a reocclusion occurred and this resulted in an extension of the venous limb to the brachiocephalic vein via sternotomy. 
Subsequently, a revision operation was necessary because of a thrombosis of the craft. An infection of the sternum occurred and was treated by negative wound pressure therapy. And the prosthetic craft was thrombosed and explanted. Shelton catheter was implanted in the right groin and the thigh craft was implanted on the left side after several interventions uh, of the PTFE loop, we decided to implant a new thigh graft on the left side. And two weeks later, the loop was partially exposed and a partial replacement of the prosthetic loop was necessary because of a wound infection with Enterobacter cloacae and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In the meanwhile, the patient developed ulcera at the lower leg, super infected with MRSA. So a new thigh graft on the right side was implanted, but this one thrombosed repeatedly and got infected. So we decided to implant a new central venous catheter via the brachial vein at the right upper arm after the subclavian vein was dilated repeatedly. Nevertheless, the catheter thrombosed several times. The patient got an arm swelling. And in April 2013, after several discussions with her and her family, she decided to stop renal replacement therapy and she died. So a real nightmare, isn't it? All excess types at all available localizations were exhausted. And the question is, what can we learn from such a disastrous case report? I think sometimes we must think about the limitation of hemodialysis therapy under ethical aspects. And that is not easy. But what life quality do you have if you spend the most time of your limited life in hospital or in the OR? Some patients would profit from an early kidney transplantation, but not all have access to it. Peritoneal dialysis and transplantation were no option in this case because of her morbid obesity. We had a great discussion in the German parliament last year about a bill of organ transplantation. And in the end, they decided an extended consent solution, a decisional solution. This means that from time to time, people are asked if they want to give their organs. Other countries do have a dissent solution and this might provide more organs. Uh, I try to summarize some points of which I think we can take home from this case. First, do we really have to do everything? From time to time, we should ask this question on the ethical aspects. And after a certain timeline, we must reevaluate the patient's history and reflect how was the course in the past and isn't it time for a change of process, for example, from hemodialysis to peritoneal dialysis, if indicated in this individual patient. In my eyes, we need a centralization of the therapy of hemodialysis patients. This patient had been treated in two hospitals and nowadays, in Germany, we are certifying vascular access centers to concentrate the therapy of hemodialysis patients in those centers. And last but not least, we need interaction in a multidisciplinary team and a weekly or monthly shunt board where all the patients are discussed. Thank you very much for your attention. Next, we will come John Sweeney and give us a talk. Just feel in. Um, okay, this is uh, Dr. Liu from Kuala Lumpur. And I was asked to present an unforgettable renal access case and lessons learned from it. And they would prefer that I present some disasters so that uh, we can all learn from it. So, sorry. Hello, Jens, Dr. Jens Wynn. Yes, I'm just, hey. um, okay. just finding my talk here. Yes, yes. Uh, just a moment. Hello. 
Hello. Coming, it's coming, it's coming. Okay. <laughs> and uh, slideshow. I can, we can see the slide. Can you see them now? No. You are on the screen. But um, I can see your screen. Uh, but I hang on go. just a second. Here we go. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Excellent. Okay. Shall I start? Yeah, yeah. yeah you can start. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this disaster I want to present, it starts off really, really well and really happy and ends up very, very bad and very sadly. So how do I advance my slide? Ah, okay, got it. So the story starts back in 2001 when I first took my appointment in Westmead Hospital in Sydney. And I was asked to see a 44 year old obese diabetic patient in end stage renal failure from another hospital in Sydney. She'd had a transplant in 1995 which had failed early on because she was not compliant with her immunosuppressants and because of antibodies. And she was considered not transplantable again. So she'd been on peritoneal dialysis since 1995, but she had repeated episodes of sepsis and eventually she had membrane failure. They placed a VASCAF and then they referred her to me for access formation. By the time I saw her, She'd had had a VASCAT in situ in the left jugular vein for 18 months, and that was her fifth VASCAT. The reason no one had created a fistula was the usual story. This patient has no veins, which is often not the case. So she came to see me in 2001 with the venous mapping, and we created a left radiocephalic fistula, which was fairly straightforward, and she started on dialysis. So she dialyzed well in center. However, as the years progressed between 2001 and 2005, she developed first of all progressive arm swelling and then facial swelling. And then she developed superior vena cava syndrome. And by 2005, she was unable to sleep in bed. She was sleeping in a chair. Venography revealed that her past vascas had destroyed the right internal jugular vein, the right subclavian vein, and the left brachycephalic trunk. So essentially, she had functional superior vena cava syndrome. And this is a picture of the patient on the operating table, was propped up with several pillows, and you can see her swollen face and her anxious expression, which is typical of superior vena cava syndrome. So this is a diagram of what she was like. She had a good radiocephalic fistula with good inflow and good outflow. She had a swollen arm, a swollen face and neck, and all those veins occluded. So we tried an endovascular attempt to open up her left brachycephalic trunk. We tried several times accessing the venous system through the fistula and through the right femoral vein retrograde but we were unable to cross these chronically occluded veins. We thought of creating a thigh fistula, but she was obese and diabetic, and we didn't think that was a good idea. So I did something that I've done a few times, which is to use a synthetic graft to decompress the outflow of a good fistula. So she had a good fistula, a good inflow, a good usable segment, but not a good connection to the right atrium. So I found the biggest graft I could get in Australia, which is a ringed PTFE graft. And I ran that from the axillary vein to her left external iliac vein. I thought this graft would remain patent because the flow in the fistula was about one liter per minute. So this is our operation. You can see the synthetic 13 millimeter ringed synthetic graft running from the axillary vein to her left external iliac vein. So the blood goes down the radial artery, up into the fistula, up to the axillary vein, 
down the graft, into the external iliac vein, and back to the heart. And here you can see how high the flow in the graft is. Here I'm holding the distal end of the synthetic graft that I'm, I'm implanting onto your external iliac vein. And when I let the graft go, you can see the blood squirting out. This is coming from a fistula. And this was a great success. All the symptoms of her superior vena cave syndrome disappeared. Her arm swelling disappeared. And this fistula graft functioned well for 10 years from 2005 to 2015. We had to perform two elective operations because of graft stenosis in 2009 and 2010, but there were minor procedures and uneventful. So it was a great success, this operation. In October 2015, the graft occluded together with the left radiocephalic fistula. So the whole system went down. We tried to salvage the graft, but were unsuccessful. She developed a swollen arm and an occluded fistula. So we placed a vas cath in her left common femoral vein. What were we to do now? She was not transplantable. She did not have a peritoneal cavity and we had lost our precious fistula. And she was only 59 years old. So we did duplex mapping, and that showed that she was suitable for a right thigh in situ deep femoral vein fistula, a procedure which I've used about 50 times in difficult cases, using the deep femoral vein. One of the contraindications to this operation, an in situ deep femoral vein fistula, is poor circulation in the leg. She was diabetic, but she had weak foot pulses and her toe plethysmography on that side was not too bad, 100 millimeters of mercury. So we decided to do a thigh fistula. Now at the time, I remember her renal physician saying to me, John, be careful. She's got calciphylaxis. Now that didn't mean much to me. And maybe to some of you in the audience, it doesn't mean much either. But after this case, I know what that means. So on the 30th of October, 2015, I created a right thigh in situ deep femoral vein fistula. The patient was obese, but the operation was fairly straightforward. And there you can see the operation where we've connected the deep femoral vein to the superficial femoral artery. So here's pictures of the operation. There's her big thigh. That's the common femoral bifurcation with a superficial femoral vein, which we're going to use for the fistula running south and the profunda femoris vein running into the thigh. And down here, you've got the above knee popliteal vein. When you do this operation, you really got to mobilize down to the popliteal vein. And here we've created the loop fistula connected to the superficial femoral artery under a skin pouch. So there's the deep femoral vein, superficial femoral vein junction at the common femoral vein. There's the anastomosis, and there's our needling segment under a loop. So it all looked really good. And remember, I've known this patient now for 15 years. So I've got a relationship with her and her family, and she's got all the confidence in me. About a week later, the whole wound starts falling apart. This is calciphylaxis. It's a necrosis of the skin and the underlying fascia because of high calcium levels destroying the arteries. It looks a bit like a third degree burn with thick leathery infarcts of the skin. So we took it back to theater and you can see it looks a mess. So we debrided it. And as you can see, it's not just the skin that's dead, but it's the subcutaneous tissue into the muscle and the fistula is partly exposed. And here's my operation note, calciphylaxis with skin ulceration. We packed the wound with six packs of saline. And these are the post-operative instructions. If the right groin bleeds, put pressure on the right groin and resuscitate the patient through the left-sided vascaf. I was worried about the whole fistula falling apart. But this is the saddest part. I decided to return her to theater in five days for skin coverage 
and delayed primary closure. I still did not understand what calciphylaxis meant. An unhappy surgeon. Five days later, the necrosis has extended further. That's the problem with calciphylaxis. Everything you touch falls to pieces and the necrosis extends. This is what the wound looks like now. We tried several times to improve the situation with debridement and got the plastic surgeons involved, but it seemed that everything we touched not only failed, but the necrosis would extend and go further. We were unable to control the calciphylaxis, which is the case. We had access failure, an enormous wound we couldn't close. There was talk of a hindquarter amputation, and in consultation with the family, we decided on palliative care, and she died 10 late, days later. The essentials of a calciphylaxis, also known as calcemic uremic arteriolopathy. It's a rare painful syndrome of calcification of the small blood vessels within the skin and subcutaneous uh, tissues. It's associated with severe hypercalcemia and is mostly seen in end-stage renal failure. Cutaneous and subcutaneous infarction causing black leathery eschars with adherent black slough and subsequent ulceration. The diagnosis is clinical. Skin biopsy shows arterial calcification and occlusion, but there is no vasculitis. This is not a vasculitic process. There is no specific treatment. Rigorous control of phosphate and calcium balance by increased dialysis, hyperbaric oxygen, and avoid tissue trauma. When you try to reconstruct, it's very hard to avoid tissue trauma. And all literature reports says it's got a very high mortality. Take home message, one, calciphylaxis is bad news. If you do have a patient with calciphylaxis, get maximum control of this before you do anything to the patient. Get your renal physicians to dialyze them rig rigorously and frequently and get them to lower their calcium levels and minimize your interventions, VASCATH only. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for Dr. Swain for the really, really nice mayor doing the uh, muscular access surgery. Is there any questions or comments? All right. We will com uh, continue to the next speaker talking about the unforgettable nightmare in access in the procedure and what I learned from it carried by the Dr. Zhu Xiongyu. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, compared with the previous three speakers' nightmare, nightmare I think I, this nightmare is not, not really nightmare. So then we, I start my, my talk. Um, I share this, this case uh, is uh, be, beginning the, the procedure, I think it's a just simple case, but finally, it's a, I fi finally I screw up the, the total failure. This one is the 16 years old male with the CKD stage five. And the, the patient received the mm -hmm. tunnel uh, central catheter uh, in, uh, placement and uh, also creation the left ran, radio cephalic AV feature in May. And uh, followed by the OBD and uh, two uh, three times, but the, the surgeon find the, the arterial flow is poor and also the vein is not dilated. So in the, uh, the, the, in the August, the, the surgeon decided to let the patient to receive the band procedure. And this is the band procedure performed by me in the radiology department in the injury room. Uh, before the band, I do the ultrasound from the radio to, uh, the, this ultrasound recorder from the radio to, and the small to the cephalic. Uh, and we can see the anesmosis is tight stenosis, also have the tight stenosis mm -hmm. in the swing segment, and also small caliber of the cephalic vein. The diameter is around uh, two to three millimeter. Then uh, we, we perform the puncture, retrograde puncture from the, uh, 
the cephalic vein at the elbow level and uh, use, uh, insert the six French thermal sheets and also use the uh, RC3 catheter and use the O1035 uh, thermal uh, wire, glide wire to pass the anastomosis. Then after pass the anastomosis, use the ultrasound to confirm the, the wire codes. This uh, sonography recurve from the cephalic vein to the anastomosis and uh, to the distal radial artery. Uh, we confirm the wire is in the radial artery and pass in the radial artery. Then uh, I cho choose the uh, change the wire to the O1A system and use the Benton uh, balloon. The size is uh, 4 by 15 to uh, perform the PTA for the band. And the first in inflation, I use the 12 bar. We can see the waist. Then I slightly move the balloon and use the 18 ATM still have the waste, so I change the balloon to the advanced 35 LP. It's the size is 5 by 8. And during inflation, the waste persists, I increase the pressure, pressure is uh, finally the, the, the balloon is rupture. The, the, the pressure in the rupture is the 18 bar. And I we try, uh, we try to retrieve the system, but all the system is stuck. So I call my colleague, the surgeon, help me us. So the, the patient sent to the OR one hour later, then he began to try to remove that. But our surgeon say he just uh, under floral, slowly, gently to retrieve all the everything. This is the, the specimen he retrieval. We can see mm -hmm. the broken, the not broken, the rupture balloon stuck in the sheath. And also we can see the distal end of casita heavy invagination. And also we can find a piece of a stripped central vein. So uh, the patient uh, arranged the the straight brachial axillary AV graft in uh, September, and also the the this graft is work, and uh, in the uh, October, the patient removed the uh, the catheter. So, uh, in this uh, simple case, I think we have a two issue must discuss. I think the first one is why did the balloon rupture? Another is the, another method, if any, another method to retrieve the uh, broken uh, rupture balloon. And I search the, the reason of the overall risk for the balloon rupture on the internet. Finally, I uh, summarize. They have uh, three reasons. The first one, chaos fire, plaque. The second one, the, less, the region morphology, especially have a a big angle or a great curve. And now, uh, the, the, the third is the balloon phys physical characters. Uh, because this patient has received the band, the cephalic vein is straight and uh, also non calcified I think the, the first one and two risk factor have been excluded. So it must be uh, due to the balloon, balloon's uh, problem. So, uh, we know the the balloon the the balloon correct is including the size and the length of the balloon and also we must uh, keep in mind the red blast pressure and also the red blast pressure is uh, is related to the size and the, the length of the balloon the balloon also we can divide divide the balloon into two category one is the general uh, balloon catheter the pressure is relatively lower, and also ha we have the high pressure balloon. So this this table is from the Cook three four uh, three five LP balloon. We can see the bigger balloon size have a lower RBP, and also this uh, this, this table is from the Benton. We can find the longer balloon have the lower RBP. 
So please keep in mind, if you change the uh, user longer balloon, the RBP is lower than the, the, the small one and the, the uh, shorter one. And also, uh, this tab these two tables is from the uh, uh, BD company. They have uh, two kinds of the uh, balloon. One is the rival and one is the conquest. We can see the rival is the, I think, is the general balloon. So the pressure is RPP is relatively low. The highest is only 14. But uh, compared with uh, the uh, general one, we can kind of, we, we see the conquest. They have the highest uh, pressure up to more to the 13, especially 30. Especially now we have the uh, uh, next generation of conquest is uh, the, re the RPP can reach the 40. This diagram uh, show the gem of the uh, broken uh, rupture balloon. Uh, in when the balloon rupture, we try to retrieve all. We can see the rupture debris of the balloon were stuck in the sheets. If we, if we force to retrieve all that, the balloon will be broken. Sometimes we, if the balloon broke, we can uh, use the snail to retrieve all that. And uh, we, we consider this, uh, our patient. This patient have a long balloon rupture and they're stuck in the sheets and our surgeon uh, even slowly, gently to retrieve that, we can see a segment of cephalic vein have been retrieved also. So we uh, discuss with our colleague, maybe next time we face this situation, we can do this procedure first. First, uh, we can have a cut down on the entry side of the cephalic vein, then remo uh, remove the, the wire, and cut down the balloon, and we can retrieve all the sheets and uh, insert a very big sheet into the uh, cephalic vein. But, but this, uh, this sheet that we doubt the introducer, so we need previous cut down to, uh, I, to, to see the, the sheets could uh, pass into the cephalic vein, then advance the uh, sheets to cover the rupture balloon and insert the O35 wire and retrieve all the balloon. This is our thinking. Maybe next time uh, we will try this again. Uh, in this case, what I learned is uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, let me know I must recheck and recheck the balloon I choose, especially the RBP. And uh, for the very tough Short region, don't use the long balloon to want to save the money. No, just use the short balloon or high pressure balloon to solve this problem. Thank you. The, the next session will be the uh, talk by the Dr. Liu by, from the Malaysia. This is uh, Dr. Liu from Kuala Lumpur, and I was asked to present an unforgettable renal access case and lessons learned from it, and they would prefer that I present some disasters so that uh, we can all learn from it. Uh, this actually is a very interesting case. Uh, there are no disasters. Nevertheless, uh, we can learn something from this case. Now, this is actually a patient with end-stage renal disease that actually presented with an ulcer over the dorsum of the left hand. She's actually a female, 32 years old. Uh, using dialysis, uh, using left BCF for the past five years and developed uh, discoloration and swelling of the left hand. The ulcer has been there for the past six months, non-healing. Uh, she says there's uh, not much pain and uh, she actually was managed with regular dressings. Uh, fistula was functioning well with a flow of 800 mils per minute. And this is how the ulcer looked like. And when you look at this, you find that there's actually ulcer over the dorsum of the left hand. Uh, looks like there's a lot of dry uh, scabs there. And there's some small area of healing. 
uh, the fingers, nails look a bit white and uh, it's slightly swollen compared to the contralateral side. And when you look, this is actually the brachial cephalic fistula that is uh, functioning well. And she actually managed it with conservative therapy. So we did a duplex scan that shows that the diameter of the cephalic vein in the arm is about 6 to 7 millimeters. The brachial arterial flow is about 1.2 liters per minute. Radial artery, there's actually a poor flow. Uh, ulnar artery is biphasic, uh, small caliber, and uh, about 1.8 millimeters. Uh, flow is at 30 centimeters per second. We then did a digital brachial index. On the right side, the normal hand is about 1.4, and on the affected side is about 0 0.7. So certainly the digital pressure is reduced. So to put this in a diagrammatic manner, <coughs> you can see the cephalic vein here, the fistula, where the fistula is. The cephalic vein diameter is 6 to 7 millimeters. The flow is about 800 mils per minute. The brachial artery is dilated to 3.5 millimeter. The flow is about 1.2 liters per minute. There's actually a cephalic vein into the forearm. The flow is about 120 mils per minute, measures about 3 millimeters, so there's a bit of retrograde flow. The uh, radial artery here, there's a short segment of occlusion, proximal radial artery, and there's actually very poor flow in radial artery. And the ulnar artery is about uh, 1.8 millimeters, diffusely small, but the flow is biphasic. So we measured the digital breaker pressure, the index about 0 0.7 that shows that the fingers are a bit ischemic. Okay, we did a CT arteriogram, and then the CT arteriogram was reported as congested brachial cephalic fistula with stenosis at the cephalic arch. There's a gross venous congestion of the forearm. There's occluded segment of radial artery measuring about 3 centimeters. There's a small left ulnar artery and poorly formed uh, palmar arch. And just to show you, this is how the CT arteriogram look like. The CT arteriogram actually showed a very good brachial cephalic fistula, the veins are very tortuous. This is actually a brachial artery going down and looks like a brachial artery, there's a bit of disconnection here. There's a short segment of occlusion. There's actually a vein, a part of a cephalic vein, there's actually retrograde flow into the forearm. And you can see actually the short segment of occlusion of the brachial artery here. And you know, this arteriogram is not so good because there's a lot of uh, venous staining. So it's really difficult for, for us to make out whether this is artery or this is vein. But nevertheless, uh, they actually reported there's occlusion of radial artery. And when you look at the uh, palmar arch here, you find that uh, quite well formed palmar arch. However, you find that the, uh, we can't see the digital vessels going to the fingers. So in this case, we think this patient has got an ulcer coming from a steel syndrome. And so how do we manage a case like this? Do we want to bypass the radial artery so the ulcer will heal? Do we want to bend the fistula even though the flow is only about 600 mils per minute? Or do we want to convert into a proximal arterial inflow ligate the brachial cephalic fistula and bring an anastomosis to a higher uh, brachial artery? Do we do a distal revascularization and interval ligation for this? Or are there any options that you can think of? Now, while we are pondering over, over how to deal with this steel syndrome, now something very interesting happened. This patient came back to the hospital with bleeding. And this is the video that the patient took when she came to the hospital. And I'll replay the video for you to see. Now this is taken by the patient. She actually brought this video to the hospital. You can see that she's bleeding profusely from this ulceration. So I question myself that number of things do not fit into this picture of the steel syndrome. Number one, if this is indeed an ischemic ulcer, why should she be bleeding so profusely? Secondly, 
had this been a still syndrome, there will be less blood going down to the hand, then why is the arm swollen? So everything doesn't fit into the picture. So even though there's an occlusion in the radial artery, to me, it does not necessarily mean this is actually a clear-cut case of still syndrome. And perhaps she actually has got a venous hypertension, secondary to the uh, collateral branch with retrograde flow. And so I was very tempted to find exactly where this branch is so that we can go in to ligate the branch. And this is a duplex scan finding that shows the uh, retrograde branch coming from the dilated uh, uh, catholic vein. And this, the flow is about 112 uh, mils per minute, going all the way down to the forearm. So I think perhaps this is actually the culprit that causes the bleed. So what we did was we went on to mark out the branch and perform a surgery. We isolated this branch. And at the same time, we also did the brachial arteriogram using a six French sheath and showed that there's actually a short segment occlusion of the radial artery. Nevertheless, there were adequate collaterals going down to the forearm. And so when we ligated this branch, this is what the initial ulcer looked like. Perhaps this is where it, one of the branches is bled from. And after the surgery with dressing, a couple of weeks later, you find that the ulcer began to heal. And over follow-up, she actually came with this, uh, what looks like a healing of a venous ulcer. And this was the last uh, follow-up. You find that the skin has now grown over the whole area and the fistula is still functioning very well. So there's lessons to be learned from a case like this. They're not ulcers, not all ulcers in the hand with the brachial catholic fistula are secondary to steel syndrome because this ulcer could also be secondary to a venous hypertension causing ulceration. In fact, the way that also black profusely showed that there's actually a venous, uh, severe venous hypertension. It's just comparable to a venous hypertension in the leg where patients bleed from this uh, viruses. Number two, not all arm swelling is caused by catholic arch syndrome or central vein occlusion because this arm swelling in this case is actually due to venous hypertension secondary to a retrograde flow. Thirdly, Reduced digital pressure after a proximal arteriovenous fistula does not equate with significant ischemia. I'm sure if we were to measure digital pressure in every patient who had a brachial capillary fistula created, their digital pressure index would be low. So it does not mean all these are due to uh, significant ischemia. And thirdly, I mean fourthly, more importantly, the venous hypertension can be severe from retrograde flow. So in a patient like this, we actually press on with ligation of the branch and we did nothing to the vein, proximal vein, uh, radial artery occlusion and the ulcer heal. So this is actually an important lesson to learn. Thank you very much. Now we open for the discussion. Could I see the pen? Okay, Dr. Yue Jialin. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes, we can yes? hear you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. A Thank you for a nice background. Me in. Yeah. Yeah. This is Jenny Yue from uh, uh, Zhongshan Hospital, Vascular Surgery Department, Shanghai. Um, based on the previous uh, speakers, um, I would like to raise uh, a topic that's about the vascular access in the lower extremity. Um, I saw uh, some of the picture previously. Um, the one uh, questions or comments from me is that for the AV graft in the lower extremity, um, we transfer first the mid tie uh, AV graft or the, the AV graft uh, uh, in the gone at the first time. And the other question is about the femoral vein transportation fistula. Um, 
I noticed that uh, um, in Dr. Sweeney's um, case, uh, you just uh, harvest a very short segment of the femoral vein. So I think I didn't catch you up. Uh, you mentioned some about the popliteal vein, um, but I think I didn't catch you. So why not to harvest the vein until the popliteal that you can uh, give the patient a longer um, cannulation lens? And, and also for that case, um, um, do you think if we use a uh, skip uh, incision and also uh, we use a uh, tunnel using a, um, a tunnel device, uh, will it be better for the patients uh, for the, I mean, for the infection of the incision? Yes, that's my question. Thank you. Dr. Zhang Shuin? Connected? Yeah, yes. Okay, um, so I, I agree with the points you make. First of all, um, we've used a lot of deep femoral vein fistulas and people worry a lot about the venous system. And that's never the problem. If you use the deep femoral vein for fistula formation, the profunda femoral system will quite adequately cope with venous drainage. So in the 50 or so cases I've done of this, venous drainage, leg swelling has never been the problem. The two problems you can run into are ischemia and wound healing. Um, the ischemia occurs because the vascular reserve of the lower limb is much less than the vascular reserve of the upper limb. So you must only do in situ femoral vein fistulas if the circulation in the leg is normal or near normal, which means they mustn't claudicate, they must have palpable pulses, and they should have relatively normal ABIs and toplethysmographies. The particular danger is the diabetics. It's not a fistula you really want to use in diabetics, but this woman we were treating had no other options left. So the first thing is in using in situ deep femoral vein fistulas, the arterial circulation has to be pretty normal. In terms of length, we routinely harvest the femoral vein from the bifurcation of the common femoral vein down into the popliteal fossa as far as we can get. The problem is you're approaching the superficial femoral vein from the front. At the adductor hiatus, the superficial femoral vein goes through the adductor hiatus into the posterior compartment. And we chase it as far as we can, because, but technically it becomes more and more difficult. Certainly you cannot chase the popliteal vein past the knee joint because it really becomes completely posterior at that point. So generally for our deep femoral vein fistulas, we harvest the superficial femoral vein plus the above knee popliteal segment. And that generally gives us a much enough room. Using skip incisions, as the cardiothoracic surgeons do to harvest long saphenous vein is a good idea, but remember the deep femoral vein is much, much deeper and less accessible than the long saphenous vein. It's really very close to the femur and in an obese thigh, it's very difficult to get at. Using a tunneling rather than a flap, I think you're correct by using tunneling, you can decrease wound healing problems by having less dissection. So I do agree that tunneling is better. Wound healing is a problem with these patients, but in this particular patient that I showed, the wound healing problem was calciphylaxis. It was terrible. It was far worse than anything I've seen with any of the other cases. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Uh Dr. Harris. I got a question for Dr. Liu regarding his last case just now. The uh, presumed still syndrome with venous hypertension. I was thinking, let's say if you treat the uh, outflow stenosis, because I've noticed the CT scan actually shows uh, venous dilatation over the cephalic vein, which 
I think could be due to the outflow stenosis. That will, by uh, doing fistuloplasty to the outflow, you can decompress the cephalic vein and also reduce the retrograde flow uh, to, to, the, to the forearm. So that can also, uh, I mean, uh, cure the problem. So rather than straight away ligate like the, the collateral. So what do you think? Do you? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, certainly. That's a, that's a good suggestion. In fact, there are many ways to manage this. Uh, unfortunately, I did not put down there the outflow stenosis was uh, about 50%. So when I look at it, I wasn't very convinced. So if, uh, if, if the outflow stenosis is very severe, certainly this is one option. But I wasn't convinced that that's actually the, that, uh, the main issue. And it's actually a collateral uh, vein that's coming down. And that's why I proceeded with the ligating the collateral vein. And later on, we can actually go back again and see if the thing becomes more severe, then I'll, I think I'll consider that. If, if that answers the question, I actually want to ask a question uh, to Swinon and also to Myers. You find that we are dealing with many obese patients now. And uh, one of the issues with obese patients is that uh, you can almost always predict what's going to happen to the excess. Uh, you know, over a period of time, you know the excess will fail. And uh, one way out is I usually take them to a site and tell them that uh, if this excess fails, they will die. And really, if they want to sort of have an alternative, is really have to go through a bariatric surgery so that. Uh, you know, peritoneal dialysis becomes an option. And if they're able, if they're able to lose their weight, we can even think of trying to, you know, uh, harvest the uh, uh, superstructure moral vein and do some other procedures for them. So I've had patients that was referred to bariatric surgery and true enough, many of them actually ended up later on with uh, peritoneal dialysis. So what do you think? Uh. Dr. Jaswene? Yes, in answer to that question, I think that gastric stapling, gastric banding is a great operation. It's the only really reliable treatment of morbid obesity, and it has many benefits. Not only does it make their uh, access and dialysis more manageable, um, but it also improves their health because it brings their diabetes under control. So I think if the patient is suitable for a gastric banding and it can be provided because it's only starting to be publicly available in uh, Australia, I think it's a very good operation. Um, before we go to our friend from Austria, um, Dr. Mayer, I'd just like to make a point about his talk. Um, he was talking about you know, getting the fistula working and optimum creation and all that and uh, preoperative fistula planning. I think there's something very important that I've learned in the last few years, and it's in fact uh, one of my um, registrars from Malaysia who introduced it to me, and that's on-table venous mapping. So traditionally we rely on preoperative ultrasound mapping to determine what fistula we make. But we know from experience that the ultrasound mapping done preoperatively is unreliable. It's unreliable in the sense that it will report a vein as being small when in fact it's not small. The superficial veins are very prone to spasm. Lots of things will cause spasm, dehydration, cold temperature, anxiety, whatever. The way we try to get around that is by using tourniquets. So we do our venous mapping with a tourniquet and without a tourniquet. But even that doesn't work very well. And it's particularly a problem in colder climates where the cold climate will cause, cause the vein to spasm. And I think we finally solved the problem and this is how we've done it. So we do our venous mapping and from the venous mapping we select right upper limb or left upper limb. And we may be able to decide radiocephalic, brachiocephalic, brachiobasilic, whatever. But we decide which limb we're gonna use. When the patient then arrives in the operating theater, our good anesthetist puts in an arm block. We do all our fistula work with arm blocks 
and you guys should do all your fisty with arm blocks. An arm block is safe, it's easy, it's cheap, it's effective, and it will give you massive venous and arterial dilatation. So by the time the anesthetist got that arm block in, you've got venous dilatation of that entire upper limb. And whereas your vein mapping said the radiocephalic fist was not suitable because the cephalic vein in the forearm was too small, that's no longer true. Under arm block, it all dilates up. So after the anesthetist put in the arm block, we get out the ultrasound and we check things again. And if we find that the cephalic vein in the forearm is now four or five millimeters with arm block, we'll do a radiocephalic fistula. And if it doesn't look suitable, we'll choose a vein in the upper arm. But the only way of getting good venous dilatation and arterial dilatation and planning your fistula effectively is with arm block. And you can only do that in theater. So for all our patients, arm block, on table repeat mapping, it doesn't take very long, and final decision on the table. Thank you. Uh, sorry, the Dr. Mayor is uh, offline. And now we have a, a question from the Dr. Zhang Jianhua. Yes, I uh, have a question for uh, Dr. Sweenan. Uh, thank you. Now I know what's the calciphylaxis. And uh, in your case, back to the beginning, uh, when the patient had uh, SVC syndrome, do you think uh, we can try uh, flow-limiting surgery, like bending or Miller, uh, to treat this patient instead of do the bypass surgery to the uh, femoral vein? Am I online? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, look, that's a very excellent question. That's a very excellent question. So if I, now this is a radiocephalic fistula and most radiocephalic fistulas do not get too big. Most radiocephalic fistulas will run at 500 mils a litre up to two litres. Radiocephalic fistulas running at more than two litres is very uncommon. <clears throat> radiocephalic, brachiobasilic fistulas, two litres, two and a half, three, four litres, so they get really big. If this was a brachiocephalic fistula running at three litres, I would have done exactly what you said. If I can't fix the outflow, I couldn't get through with my wires and balloons, decrease the inflow. The fistula's only got to run at 500 mils a minute to do effective dialysis. Everything extra makes the outflow problem, the superior vena cava problem worse. So certainly, if it's a high flow fistula, there's an outflow obstruction I can't fix, I would do exactly what you say. I'd band the fistula down to 500 mils a minute. The trouble with this patient is that she had a radiocephalic fistula and was only running at one liter a minute. And banding that down would have been difficult and I don't know if it would have been successful. Banding a fistula under one liter is difficult. Banding a fistula at two liters is much easier. So that would have been an option, but I think the option we chose there in the end was very successful. But your comments are quite correct. Thank you. Here are some questions from the audience online. The question for Dr. Swinon, can we learn on block by ourselves? Uh, the, um, the audience want to learn the training program provided by Dr. Swinon. Thank you. Sorry, what exactly is the question? He want to learn on block technique provided by you. How to unblock a fistula? Um, arm block, do you arm block. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So arm block, um, it's something that our service has developed over the last five years. And uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but it's actually quite straightforward. Arm block's been around for a long time. And whenever people offered me arm block, I said no, for two reasons. First of all, arm block is not always effective. And secondly, it causes complications, arterial punctures, venous punctures, nerve injuries. But the thing that has revolutionized arm block is ultrasound guided arm block. Ultrasound guided arm block is very precise. It's very safe. It's very effective. It's very easy and it's very rapid to do. 
And I would say that if you don't have a friendly anesthetist who will do the arm block, do it yourself. I mean, I'm tempted to do arm block myself and I'd be, it'd be easy to learn. All you need is an ultrasound probe and a syringe with 20 mils of uh, xylic N2%. However, medical legally, I can't do it in Australia because I'm not an anesthetist and we've got good anesthetic service. But if in your country, you can't get your friendly anesthetist to do it, learn it yourself. But the critical thing is ultrasound guided. Do not do arm block without ultrasound guidance because it turns a safe, effective procedure into a dangerous, ineffective one. One further comment on arm block. When we talk about arm block, blocking the forearm is very easy and straightforward and very effective. Blocking the arm less so. The higher up you go, the less effective the block becomes. Now you can place the block below the clavicle, above the clavicle, or intrascaling. Now the higher the pl you place the block, the more effectively you block the upper limb. But here is a note of caution. Do not do any arm blocks above the clavicle. All your arm blocks go below the clavicle. I'll just say that again. No arm blocks above the clavicle. The reason is, if you put an arm block above the clavicle, you're going to start knocking out the phrenic nerve. A supraclavicular block will knock out the phrenic nerve in 50% of cases. An intrascaline block will knock out the phrenic nerve in 100% of cases. Now, if you knock out my phrenic nerve, I'll get a bit short of breath. If you knock out the phrenic nerve of a patient in renal failure who's fluid overloaded, they may end up in renal failure and acute respiratory failure and need intubation. So no arm blocks above the clavicle. Below the clavicle, very safe, as long as it's done with ultrasound. Hello, uh, have anyone, have, uh, Jackie, we raise the question because of the time limit. Jackie? Right, I, I think actually this is an uh, excellent section. Uh, if you all uh, follow our previous meeting, you'll know that this is a new section in DAISY. It wasn't there in the last two, but I think this is really, really a great section because all of you have, uh, in each of these nightmare cases, uh, brought out a very, very important message. And I think uh, I learned really a lot uh, over the, the cases. And uh, just a little bit regarding the uh, nerve block, the brachial plexus nerve block. Uh, well, I, I know that there are courses training people to do this nerve block. So uh, anyone interested can email me, I forward you to those training courses. And I, I think this is a very important component uh, as one of the measure to uh, encourage uh, fistula success and also um, uh, a better selection of the vein. So next year, we will definitely include uh, anesthetists uh, to give us talk on the arm board as well. Yeah, so uh, I think, thank you all the speakers to bring in very, very good case. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Miyata. Um, I'm a, I'm a co-chair person, so that I should say something, but uh, during uh, 30 years of the, uh, my experience of the, about, uh, about AV fistula and then uh, AV graft and then also uh, intervention treatment, but, uh, and I thought uh, that uh, probably everybody thought that we have uh, enough experience about the complications, but uh, I, I have never imagined that uh, we, we, we can share more and more uh, the complication of rare cases like this. And it is very much uh, interesting and, and uh, very much educational for us all. Thank you very much. And now we have a, a, a Taiwan audience. They want to ha have a question. So now I open the, the Q&A for him. Yeah. 
、呃，那个台湾的呃医师，他你自己把开把声音打开，然后进来。Okay, I think、um, now we close because of technical error. So now we close the this section and thank you, everyone.